Hi, everybody. I'm Amanda Dyer, the co-director and producer of the documentary Unseen, How We're Feeling Parent Caregiver Caregivers and Why It Matters. I am joined by Tom Dyer, who is also the director and cinematographer of the film, and Jess Ronnie, who is in the film and also wears a lot of other hats as the founder and CEO of the Lucas Project and also Hope Farm and is an author with multiple books, which we'll talk about. Anything else, Jess? I think that's it. You covered all the okay. bases. That's pretty good. There's always, there's so many, it's, it's hard to keep track. It's <laughs> yeah, long list. Yeah. This. But thank you guys for being here. Um, we're excited to have Jess. Um, I know after, if you watch the documentary, you learned a lot about their family, but of course there's always a lot more. People have different questions. So we wanted to do this little Q&A, just kind of go a little bit behind the scenes. Um, you have a question, you are welcome to drop it into the Q&A. There should be a little Q&A tab on your screen, maybe on the bottom of the window where you can drop it in there and we will try to get to it. Um, but we can also just kind of start at the beginning here. So uh, Jess, one thing that I get asked a lot um, when I'm talking about the film is, well, what, what are the Ryan doing now? What are, what are they up to? So can you tell us first, what's the, what's the latest with the Ronnie family? Yeah, um, the Ronnies moved to Michigan since, well, we were in Michigan when we completed the filming, but we have moved into our new home, which we were building during the filming. Um, and that's been wonderful. We're still kind of getting settled and we still kind of live in a construction zone because it's not totally completed yet. <laughs> um, Ryan, <laughs> Ryan took over after drywall. So that was a blessing in that um, we were able to save a lot of money, but also um, still a work in progress for sure. Uh, the Lucas Project has grown considerably since the release of the film, and that's been great just to be able to serve so many caregivers in a bigger capacity. Um, and I finished writing a third book, which um, is scheduled to be released on Valentine's Day, so February 14, 2023. That book is called Lovin' with Grit and Grace. Um, and that's just uh, Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Day yes. <laughs> Stories. Uh, we, get, we often get asked the question, like, how in the world are you guys still married <laughs> with all mm -hmm. the stuff? So um, statistically, we had about a 5% chance of making it. And the publisher was like, hey, you guys are going on 12 years. You want to write a book? So we agreed um, reluctantly <laughs> to write a book about marriage. <laughs> <laughs> is it an is it an instruction manual or yes uh, um it's an instruction nice. manual <laughs> <laughs> do you want to get a copy of it right. Tom did a project with you know. his wife so you know that <laughs> yes. we'll move as well. yeah we might be able to use it um so that's actually a good segue because one of the questions i got earlier was um how what has life you manage marriage throughout all these different layers um i think like you said the statistics are not good for families who have kids with disabilities um it you know adds such a, a layer that no one expected so how what is what are your secrets what do you feel like give, give us a preview of the the book probably is what's going to happen here <laughs> Um, I think we've just, we went into our marriage after having loved and lost, being very, very intentional about the fact that our marriage had to be a top priority. Um, with seven grieving children, we realized if we did not make our marriage a top priority, and what that meant for us was like intentionally carving out space to go on that weekly date night and take time together to really get to know each other. Um, and even within the, the home life, um, allowing ourselves to say at times to the kids, okay, this is mom and dad time, um, and just cultivating that relationship. And then we're both big believers in just like rhythms in, in life. Like there are these rhythms in, in ourselves and within our marriage that just really help our whole life click and tick in a smooth way. So um, I think it's, it was just really being intentional. And I know people have said to me too, how can I incorporate that in, intentional feeling in a relationship if I haven't loved and lost? Um, and it's, I'm not entirely sure. It's just making that decision that um, 
my spouse is a top priority. And in order for our relationship to grow and blossom, we need to spend time together because you just can't grow if you're not spending time with that individual. So do you feel like you have to keep your spouse still? So what I hear from parents a lot is that if you have a child with, or an adult child even with um, significant needs, how do you And they're the number one priority, you know, that's going to rocket to the top of the list of priorities almost all the time, especially if there's like, you know, medical complexity where they have medical attention 24 seven. How do you make your spouse the priority when you have that component? I know for us, we seek out respite, like our life depends on it. And I've said, In previous conversations, we don't drive fancy cars, um, we don't go out to eat, but we do set aside funding for respite. And what I mean by respite is finding those caregivers that we do have to pay $20 an hour for um, to come and watch Luke for a couple of hours or to enter into our life so that we have some help. Um, And it's just priorities, like, like, we don't do fancy stuff um, because that is a top priority to be able to spend time together and to be able to spend time with the typical children outside of the special needs component. So um, every Saturday we have somebody who almost every Saturday, we do have somebody who takes Luke for a fun outing for three, four five hours. And we use that time to spend time with our other kids, like doing activities that Lucas wouldn't enjoy and wouldn't want to be a part of anyway. Um, so that's just how it works for our situation. Yeah. So you brought up really that coming down to prioritizing that respite as the only, you know, the only way you're going to be able to make that, that a priority. And you brought up the siblings too. That's the other big topic that I got, that I get questions for. Um, you know, I think you have a, unique perspective on this, having several other children as well. So how, how, what, what's your thoughts on the, how to, how to balance the needs of all of your children in your life? Um, I don't know, this might be a little bit of a controversial perspective, but as the oldest of 12 kids, like I didn't grow up either being like, the like the apple of my parents eye I wasn't an only child and that was just my story we there were 12 of us we banded together the siblings are all incredibly close today um and that's just my kids story as well they have a story of a profoundly disabled brother and they are very close and we do a lot as a family unit um but not so much individually we do try to carve out those special times like on birthdays Um, to make that one child feel very special and to have that intentional time together. But we're also the family that sits down at the dinner table together five nights out of seven. And we talk and we cut up and we ask kids about their day and we eat a meal together. And I guess that's just been more of a priority for us as a family unit to approach it more as a team than like this individualized um, time that every child needs with us on every single given day. So um, I don't know. I don't think they're lacking. They're loved. They're cared for. They know they're loved and cared for. And it's, again, just their story. And I think they're becoming beautiful, compassionate human beings. And that's, I, I believe, any parent's desire for their children as they launch into adulthood, that they see other people and that they care. hmm have you ever dealt with any of them kind of ex- expressing like frustration or um, like comparing to other families that don't have this factor? Do you, have you had to deal with that head on, especially if they get older? Um, I don't think the comparison so much because Ryan and I will take the brunt of that um, and we will divide and conquer. Even tonight, Josh and Jada have a concert at their school and we don't have anybody to stay with Luke. So we went back and forth, like, how are we going to do this? Are we going to swap places like halfway in the middle of the concert? Like you come home and then I go and we just decided that I'm going to stay home with Luke tonight um, and he's going to go to the concert. So I don't think that the typical kids feel slighted because we we take on the brunt of that burden, I guess. Um, we I feel slighted that I don't get to watch the kids play their concert. Um and then what was the other part of your question? 
I don't know. How, how do you, <laughs> do you, have you had to deal with it direct? Like, do you talk with them about it? Like, oh, is yeah. There, yeah. Do you um, directly kind of. We had a period of time where one of the kids um, would tell everybody, Luke is their favorite. Luke is their favorite kid. And Ryan and I would kind of look at each other like the the perspective of this child thinking, <laughs> not that we don't love Luke, but like we have to care for Luke 24 seven, like Luke has to be on our radar at all times. So just sitting down with her and explaining, it's not that Luke is our favorite child. He is not capable of doing these things on his own. There is no independence in him. So yes, it might appear like and I mean, I did create a nonprofit after Luke and we created this whole <laughs> documentary, you know, around caring for Luke. So I think that's pr- probably where the perception is coming from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do you feel like, what do you tell other moms who, I mean, I feel like what I see a lot is just the guilt of like, you know, we're prioritizing these needs. How do we, I feel guilty all the time mm-hmm. about, um, you know, not being able to do everything with my other kids. How, what would you tell those moms? Um, I used to really struggle with a similar guilt. And then I think I just kind of wrap my mind around this is their story and it's a good story and they're going to have to make peace with their story. And um, I, I hope they do at some point. Do we lose Amanda? Oh, sorry. <laughs> my uh, charger fell out and I just want to make sure we should, don't lose my thing here. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. Making peace. <laughs> oh, I just think, um, I, you know, I don't know. I don't. Victimhood is not <laughs> an appealing trait <laughs> for me to witness. So I know all of our kids have been through stuff and, um, I think most of them would not even consider Lucas to be their hardest stuff. They, seven of the kids have lost a parent. Um, So I don't know that my kids necessarily focus on that. And in terms of um, other parents, I think kids kind of follow the modeling of the parent. And if you are constantly wallowing in sort of this victimhood status, like, there's no help, there's no support, there's nothing I can do. I think kids will follow suit. But if you're willing to get out there and join communities making change and try to make change for yourself and try to advocate for your child. And I think that kids will view that and try to do something similar. Yeah. So kind of the the family culture that you Mm -hmm. create around it. Right. Um, What about how would you, and you said kind of earlier that one of the biggest things was prioritizing that respite and whether that's to do something with your spouse or to do something with your other kids. Mm -hmm. Um, What, what, and I know that the comments are always like, yes, of course we want to do that, but we can't find anyone who will Mm -hmm. provide respite or I don't trust anyone or um, what, what do you say? What's your advice to that? And I, I think that falls on the same lines. Like you can take a position of like, well, there's nothing I can do, mm-hmm. but what do you suggest as how do you jump over that? Like that's a very valid hurdle. hundred percent. How do you jump over that hurdle to get to that respite? Like, do you have any tips for someone who right now feels like I can't even find respite and I have no options? Um, I know it was almost like a full-time job for me for about a month. Um, just putting out the ads everywhere I could think of word of mouth interviewing, oh gosh, I probably interviewed 30 potential caregivers to settle on three that have been now consistent for almost a year. Um, So I think again, and I'm not saying everybody struggles with this victim mentality, but I do see it often playing out in the special needs community, like just woe is me, there are no resources, there's nothing out there, this is just my life. And again, I would just encourage you to like, literally seek for it like your life depends on it because it might because you cannot continue to go 24 7 for the rest of your life as the sole caregiver for your child you need it um, in order to take care of you you need it in order to take care of your relationships and your other children and your spouse and your friends and all of those components so um 
I, I mean, I understand the hurdles, but again, it's like really almost approaching it like a full-time job for a period of time until you find a couple of trusted individuals who can really enter into your life and your space with you. Yeah, I was surprised when we worked with um, an agency that provides you know, provides resources for, for caregiving families. Um, and they're well aware of the shortage of care workers um, even if you have the funds to be able to pay them, it's, you know, if you can't find the person, that doesn't really get you further. And they're, they said they really counsel people on who is already in your circle that you can pull in as, you know, explain what, what does it mean to provide respite for our family and what would you have to do? And it's not as scary as you might think it is and to really look to those relationships you already have. It's someone you trust, um, someone who, you know, close to your family. Um, and start there rather than even just people you don't know. And that brings in all kinds of other, you know, risk factors as well. Right. Yeah. Um, what about what is not in the documentary that you think that, you know, we talked about from early on, we had a million different things that we could cover in lots of different directions that we could go. Um, is there anything that you like wish we could have fit in there or um, wish we hadn't put it in there. <laughs> what do you, well, I can't, that I can't wait to hear the answer for this one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were so many <laughs> angles that we could have headed down. Um, one component that I've been writing about more often is even the fact that we had to leave Tennessee to move back to Michigan to well, find. The I was going to ask about this. Yeah. Were you? Um, well, and- it's, it's something that I don't, I think a lot of people don't, don't know. We never, it's not something we talk about, but for, for Amanda and I, this was a huge thing. Um, and so mm-hmm. when we think about like the whole journey of the film, like this is one of the first thing that comes to our mind. So I'm very curious to hear your uh, take on this. Um, <laughs> I don't know how political we want to get here. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we pretty much have set the stage of not holding much back. So, okay. Yeah. Um, you be honest. Well, Okay, to be honest. I, I felt like um, I, I'm a I'm pretty conservative. Um, I'm I'm a Christian. I attend church, and I attended even Baptist churches in Tennessee, which admonished mothers in my situation uh, with a profoundly disabled child that I was carrying at 20 weeks um, in utero. Admonished mothers to never, ever, ever terminate, and that. Um, was part of my belief system as well when I was carrying Lucas. However, when these mothers give birth to these children, all of that support seems to go by the wayside. And that's a struggle, I think, even in Tennessee, a very red conservative Republican state, there is this messaging of don't terminate. However, we're not going to provide any resources or support if you choose life for that child. And then therefore heading back to Michigan, a much more democratic blue state and finding and having the resources and support that we need here. So there's this disconnect, I think, between the church and the conservative party in general that they, we need to figure this out because if you're going to admonish mothers to carry these babies to term, then we also need to provide the supports and the resources afterwards. Um, so that's, that's one angle that I think would be really interesting to explore as I continue my advocacy work. And then also this angle of, of what's, what's the answer when they do fall off this cliff, when they're, when they age out of the school system and we're kind of creating our own answer, but man, I mean, we are just coming up against so much bureaucratic BS, like one hurdle after another. And as I'm constantly battling through all of this bureaucratic red tape, I'm realizing the system is designed to discourage, not encourage. And then there's that question of why is it designed to discourage? Is it money? Is it because the money's there and there are lots of willing people um, willing to create some services and support, 
for families. But when you're constantly battling everything, you kind of get to this point of just going, forget it. You know, I'll create this for my kid and then I'm done. And I'm, I'm trying to put my finger on why, why the system is designed to discourage and not encourage um, more programs. Like solutions. Yeah. Okay. Solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually, I heard that from um, someone here when we were doing a screening in Nashville where Tom and I live, we um, talked to a lot of parents locally and they're, they were telling me that their Tennessee recently added a, a program um, and it it's funded, like it has the resources, but there's, it's very little of it has been used because the process is so hard. There's like two tiers of it and mm -hmm. you, you know, a parent whose kid should qualify for the uh, higher level of support can't get approved. It's so much paperwork. It's so many hurdles that it's like, I'm, is it even worth it? Is what I'm going to get from it even worth all the rings I would have to jump through to, to get it. Um, and so, yeah, you ask yourself like, okay, that was great that it, the program is in place, but why was it? Do you, I mean, is it, do you think that's it? It's to, Say like so you can say on paper we all voted for this and we have it and look how great we are and supportive and then you don't actually have to spend any of that money because no one can get to it well that's that's what i'm starting to question i see so many people in these positions of power collecting paychecks like good paychecks but this money is not funneling into the supports that the families need and why do we need like five people in this one you know, category, micromanaging all of these, like since Lucas um, entered adult services, he's had five separate assessments within, I mean, he turned 18 in August, five major assessments to determine his abilities and his like, could we not maybe put all of these assessments into one category and save some money here and then move forward accordingly? Um, I just, and I've only been in it for a couple of months, but I'm really starting to question, I guess, where all of these funding sources are being funneled and are they being funneled to the families? Because I'm not so sure that they are. Yeah. And I don't know how it works. Like if it's, if the funds are earmarked for a certain program, mm -hmm. is that fine? like, can they, if they can't go anywhere else, then what's the point of restricting them so much? But if they can, then I don't know, maybe that's, part of it or how many um, supervisors yeah. and case managers and yeah. like all of these separate components do we really need all of these separate components not really we need respite money <laughs> so it seems like we're so we're so afraid of someone getting something they don't deserve like mm -hmm. <laughs> someone who sh who doesn't need it it's like getting so it, heavily that policed yeah it that is. we keep yeah. people who legitimately deserve it from being able to access it but even in creating a system and having to work with the bureaucracy right now, it's just like one roadblock after another where I'm like, yeah. do you want me to create this, this product that is going to solve a lot of problems in this county or, I mean, make it a little bit easier on me rather and than- And you're talking about making a respite center- A residential, a, right. A residential. Respite. Yeah. Yes. It's just been one yeah. thing- And so you're another. having it. Okay. So I think that you, you brings know, up an interesting point. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to um, kind of like the, the flip side to, to some of that that we're talking about. Um, one, one conversation that we did have um, that didn't actually make it into the film, um, and this was, this was an, an interview we were doing with Ryan, was, um, was talking about when you all moved to Tennessee and um, the research that you all did, it, it made it seem like there were a lot of um, state resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you all get here and he tells the story about contacting someone. I don't even remember what the resource was, but it was plainly written that this resource existed and that Luke would qualify for it. And, and he was calling to, to set that up. And the person said like, yes, um, this is supposed to exist, but we just don't have the money. Or there, there's some story that he told that was like, it made you all believe and made people in a similar position as you believe that Tennessee, in this case, did have these resources. But when um, the time came to actually call those resources into action, it just wasn't there. 
And so like the advertising for it was there, Mm -hmm. but the actual resource there itself wasn't there, whether it was, it was either staff or, or, um, financial that it was, it was, it It might've been a wait list. That's what they don't advertise is, yeah, we have all of these programs on our website and you get here and you meet with the case manager and you make the calls and it's like, oh, but there's a 15 year wait list. Yeah. And you're not going to see any of that till your kid's 40. So I think that's where the disconnect lies with a lot of these states. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Amanda, we've got a, we've got a few um, audience questions. You want to jump into those? Yeah, I think this one's on, I just saw one that's about this topic. Um, Yeah. They said, I live outside of Chicago and recently heard that although the restrictions listed on the social security and Medicaid site for our state say our son isn't eligible for the benefits before 18, I've heard we need to apply and appeal the first denial and he could start getting benefits before 18. Have you ever experienced anything like this? It's another example of the system being designed to keep us from applying in the first place. Yeah, I've heard of lots of people winning that appeal. Um, we, we did not have to go through that because Lucas received survivor benefits from his late mm-hmm. father. So he wasn't eligible for that. But I have heard of stories where families appeal and they win that appeal. Is it, yeah, is it another thing that's crazy. just... You just have to- Oh, you know, it's so crazy to me. It's like you, you all are already, your hands are so full already. Mm-hmm. And here's this thing that could be a benefit, but there's like, you have to trick the system. Yep. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's just mm-hmm. continually mind blowing. I don't know. And I don't understand because it seems like such a, it's a, a typically from what I've heard of a bipartisan thing. Like we, as a community, we mostly agree. We want to support people with disabilities and their families. So if that's the general consensus, why do we have all these hurdles? Like when, so I don't know, when push comes to shove, is that not really true? This is right. what, it, what it makes me think. Um, or, you know, goes back to the idea of like, if I don't know anybody that is, if I don't know a family that's dealing with this and I can't picture a family that this would be helping, then I don't think it's worth allocating resources to. Um, yeah. Or I've heard the sentiment too, like, why should your kid get free money? And it's like, what? Yeah. (laughs) And maybe that's more of the Republican angle, like less government, you know, why should your kid get a paycheck just for being disabled? Um, But again, it's like, if if we're going to stick to that pro-life mantra. What kind of world do we want to live in here? (laughs) Right. And we need to support these caregiving families as well. So it's but I think it's it's really touching on a complicated thing because if you yeah and, and I hear this from a lot of people too is if we say if we talk about supporting in terms of like individuals saying you know and the documentary does address I think it, it there's a little bit of everything like what can you do if you're an individual what can you do if you're an organization what can you do if you're if it's public programs um so that everyone can kind of think about your own realm of influence um but i have found that there's not much consensus on what the solution should be so like if if we ever talk about um you know individuals supporting each other i hear people say well that's great but i don't i don't have anyone near me i'm a single mom i'm a you know i live in a rural area there's no resource you know whatever that doesn't work for everyone they don't have that kind of individual support or like community support and if we talk about public programs or, you know, government-based programs for people say, well, that's no good because we get disqualified. It's so hard to navigate. People don't care. It's dangerous. So it feels like there's not consensus on what the solution is. And therefore it's hard to advocate for something because there's, if people, if there's not momentum towards something, then it it isn't going to happen. Do you have any thoughts? Like how do we balance those two, those two sides? Well, again, I think I mentioned this this to you maybe last week. I think uh, caregivers really get on the same page when their child falls off that cliff and it's like, okay, we need something. So maybe we're not all- You mean when they age out of- When they um, age out of school, yes. And then there's nothing. And I think we need more day programs that are inclusive. And by that, I mean, also accept um, children like mine who are incontinent, 
that's a big roadblock that we've always come up against is, yeah, there are special needs camps and programs and after school activities. And, but Lucas can't go to any of them because he's incontinent. So it, we need more inclusivity, I think, with day programs and then residential options for those who do want to pursue that um, for their loved one. And all, often it's even a stepping stone, like it's first, you know, dipping your toe into the day program and getting comfortable with this idea and then maybe moving forward with a residential option later on. Um, and then for those the younger families or the families raising younger children, I think what we often hear is that respite component. So just more funding, I think for respite dollars, and maybe that's giving some of that um, freedom back to the families to hire their own providers, because that seems to be sort of, that's, that's different in every state as well. Like, do you have to take the providers that the state just offers you, which can be very iffy. Um, And then you're letting that stranger into your space or can we just give the funding to the parents that qualify and they can hire their own individuals to help care for their child? Yeah, we worked with an organization that does that. They they provide the dollars through grants and donations and things, and then the families can recruit whoever they mm-hmm. want to to be the to be the caregiver. Um, yeah, we talked about with another. I I was sitting in on another panel with in one of our screenings and. Um, there was they were interviewing a, a therapist i think and she she was saying that she often gets asked by families to provide private respite care because you know they trust her and she knows their families but what she can it, it creates so much inequity in the idea that basically only people who can afford to pay out of pocket a high rate are the ones who can find that care so if we you know and i have a theory too that if we A lot of it boils down to the fact that we don't value care work. Yes. So, yeah. So whether that's professional or as a, as a culture, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a culture. And, you know, you can see that by the pay, it's always lagged behind. Um, And we just, you know, we saw that in the pandemic with, you know, nurses and care, they were the ones just bearing the brunt of it. It's like work till you fall over. Um, and we just don't respect care as a, as a profession, as, a, as work. Right. And that yeah. somehow, you know, I'm like, how, what's the, what's the national marketing campaign about how we make, how we elevate the job of caring? I don't, I haven't solved that problem yet, but. Oh, you and <laughs> I need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. I it, it feels like agree. so much of this boils down to that. Yes. Yeah. And it's so interesting because I mean, the foundation of life is caregiving. Like yeah. we enter the world needing care and we most likely will leave the world needing care. So it's a mm-hmm. full circle life experience and we do not yeah. elevate it or honor it or respect it like we should. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Agreed. like, that's the root of it until we do that. Why would we expect any of these other things to change right. if it's always like the least valued thing that you could yeah. do? That's, that's the most important piece that has to, has to fall into place for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, kind of talking about community support. Um, uh, Francine had a question here that is, um, uh, I'm a school, uh, uh, I'm a school social worker in New York at a school for special education, which serves children with medical complexities. I'd be very interested in knowing how we can do better for our families. Um, so in, in the education context, uh, in the ed- education context, so I'm, I'm sure you've, um, experienced, um, teachers and schools and, uh, all kinds of things like that. What's, what's your perspective on what has been good? What, what are some things that haven't been good? Um, yeah. How how would you respond? Um, I think something that's often missing with caregiving families is that before after school component, Mm. um, which often requires one of the parents to become that full-time caregiver, which is usually the mother, you know, leaving her career and caring for her child. Um, And just to even offer a component like that, where there is a before after school option for a disabled child is huge. Or, you know, a once a month respite opportunity where all of the teachers maybe get together and 
offer something after school or on a Saturday just to give the, the parents a breather. And I guess I would admonish too, like not a two or three hour breather. It's really nice to have like a four or five hour chunk of time where you can actually really decompress get some stuff done, take a nap if you need to, or whatever that looks like. Um, the two or three hour is, is okay. But by the time all the stress of actually getting your child to that respite opportunity and filling out all the paperwork that is involved when you're, um, dealing with this population and then running to try to relax for, you know, an hour, hour and a half, and then whipping back to get your child. It's not truly, respite. So I think we need to start to have those conversations about even extending that time period a little bit for these families. Yeah. Like extending the school day too. I'm sorry. I've heard that and just, it, I've heard that in general too, like a challenge for any parent is that the school day doesn't match the work day. Mm-hmm. And so everyone's, yeah. you know, scrambling around to um, manage that, that gap of time. But um, every typical that, child, like, has that option has and, more options, and you might yeah. have to pay for it, but that option is there. If you need it with your typical children, it's not there with our disabled kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we also added, I'm going to create a peer to peer support pro- program. Have you ever had experience with this model or do you think there's value to it? Um, in what context, like a church? Um, or I a think in the, also the school. Stuff in the school. Yeah. Um, we had a short experience with that model, um, in one of our school systems in Tennessee, but we were only there. Well, we were only there for a couple of months before the world went into lockdown. So I can't really speak into that. I know at our church, they do have the one-on-one buddy system. So Lucas has really gotten to know his buddy in the special needs classroom, Um, And that's been a huge benefit for us where we can go and, and worship and in our space. And Lucas has his own space that he can do whatever he wants to do. I'm not entirely (laughs) sure what he does in his space, Um, but we've, they've tried to bring him into church a couple of times and he just hollers all done Bye, see you later. So (laughs) that is not interesting to him. Oh, they actually elaborated. um, She said, uh, a needs assessment at the school revealed that parents are feeling socially isolated. So, okay, so she meant, and if you want to clarify, feel free to, oh, um, like, like a, like a peer support, support for parents. For parents. I, yeah, yeah, that's cool. No, I've, I've done like online support groups. Um, again, I think those are in person is always difficult because of that respite component. Yeah. So if you're going to offer like a respite component, in addition to the one-on-one support group, um, then I think it works but also making it kind of community based, like let's all get together for a meal or um, not necessarily. I think as special needs parents, we, we get very caught up in support groups and, um, you know, trying to solve all of our problems all the time. And we sort of forget to just relax and unwind sometimes and just like have a normal conversation and a meal with a friend um, and, just, you know, trying to encourage caregivers to get more community based and just relax. <laughs> That's really mm-hmm. difficult. Uh, one thing I kind of came to after talking to so many parents was that a lot of the issues are, you know, to this point, a lot of the issues that they're dealing with really weren't necessarily even just the system or bigger picture stuff a lot of times it was just like not having a close friend Mm -hmm. like someone you you know that will understand that your life is different and be sensitive to that and still check in with you and invite you to things and be a listening ear I mean those are those are things that are what a friend does you know they're not some elaborate program it's it's friendship um so yeah I think that just and and you know I'm not talking not from personal experience but from anecdotally we heard parents during interviews and things that yeah maybe facilitating those friendships like you know I know as, even, as adults it gets harder and harder to make friends and keep up friendships regardless of your family life but um assist them to help promote those friendships um makes sense to me based on based on what we heard 
Yeah, but that comes again with that respite component. So, um, and I think caregivers often almost shoot themselves in the foot because we're so immersed in the online world, which is like a form of community, but it's not like true community. And we begin to almost see that as our all encompassing community of support. And it's not really, it's, you know, it's a false sense, I think, of community when we really need to be out in the community with other people and sharing what we're struggling with and allowing other people to help us in that capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, What about, let me change gears a little bit. Um, What was uh, the difference that you encountered? So a a comment we also see a lot and everything I have to say is what I hear from (laughs) from families by talking um, is whenever we talk about caring for uh, kids or adults with disabilities, people say, well, I'm doing elder care and that's hard for all these reasons. And I'm doing, you know, caring for my spouse and that's hard for all these reasons. So I almost sometimes see like kind of a competitiveness of like, which is harder, who, who gets more resources, who needs more resources, which um, I think that's not the, that's not the way to approach it. Um, but what, did, what have you seen the difference between, I know you've been a caregiver in a couple of different capacities. So what's, what's different about those experiences, like caring for your spouse or like an old person versus a disabled person? Um, I mean, in terms of funding, caring for a spouse who has terminal cancer, we did not really worry about anything. Um, but again, I guess the only thing I can really say is the difference was in the way the world perceived it. When I was caring for Jason for three years, as he had terminal cancer, I had so much support. I was almost overwhelmed. Like I did not cook a meal for a year. Um, People were more than eager to bring Jason to appointments and to help in any capacity. And then Jason passed away in 2010. Whereas with Lucas, um, I had him. And then we went home after two weeks of being in NICU and everybody kind of rejoiced and they were, they kind of like wiped their hands clean of my problems because Lucas wasn't even supposed to be born and he was born. And then there was like this celebration because we are going home and they will be fine. And now we're on 18 years of Lucas being profoundly disabled. And I think society is more on board when there's like, a beginning and an end. But when they look at Lucas, it's like, well, how long is this going to go? Like we, as human beings, we like to solve problems. And so with Jason, there was an ending, he died. So it was either he was going to die or go into remission. And with Lucas, they human beings just can't like quite grasp, like, how long do we have to help them? Like, what if he lives to be a hundred? Do we have to keep showing up for this family? So I think that's the only major difference I can really speak into is how society perceived the two different caregiving experiences. Mm -hmm. You think people are overwhelmed by the idea that supporting caregivers of disabled kids and and their future adults, children, is seems too daunting like because of the where do we begin and then also like what if I do it wrong what if I step into this space and it's like way more than I anticipated because there isn't a rule book for kids like these I mean they're all very individual and unique and their needs and um you know personalities and so maybe inadvertently stepping into that space with that family and then going I, this is above me. I don't want to do this. And then how do I gracefully like get out or doing it incorrectly? Like, what if I offer to provide respite and then I don't know what to do. And then I look stupid or, um, again, I think it's just having those conversations surrounding it and it's daunting. Um, Lucas is profoundly disabled, but it's very healthy. I mean, we could be doing this till he's 70, 80 years old. I mean, he is a very healthy individual. So there's like no end date 
to how long do we have to come alongside this family and do this? Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, uh, I hope that's what the documentary can be used for too, is just kind of demystify that a little bit. Like, because parents will say like, you know, I didn't know how to do these things before we had our kid. Like, you know, I learned on the job. <laughs> I don't right. have any special, you know, trait, you know, maybe some do, but rarely do they have anything that someone else can't learn to do or get comfortable with. You just did it because you had to. Um, so if, you know, if you feel then any motivation at all to support families that can be overcome, but yeah, understand that it's a, can be daunting from the outside. So hopefully that's kind of where we're starting with this. Um, and actually to that point, I, I've had a couple of people to say that they are, have, tr- have really have trouble asking for help that they feel like, um, or even someone said that they wanted to share the documentary with their um, family, but they didn't as kind of like, hey, here's a glimpse into our life, but they felt like it would come off as complaining or like, um, I don't, you know, I don't want to put that on them or um, that that it would be too much. I don't know. What's your, what do you, what's your response to, to like to that? If we don't share our stories, no one will know. Um, so I don't even know that it has to be a direct ask as much as it could just be sharing some things on social media, sharing about the documentary, sharing about your life in a um, respectful way, which can be kind of a fine line uh, when we're dealing with kids like ours. Um, but I, I'm a big proponent in if, if people don't know, they can't help. So if you want help, you need to begin to open your mouth and share about your struggles because that that's not on, on other people anymore. If you share and people don't help, then that's on them, but it's not on them. If you don't tell them what you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think people, might, you might be surprised about people reacting positively that you didn't expect. Mm-hmm. And if they don't react positively, then move along. <laughs> they were going to help anyway. You know, that's not the, that's not the right. right I, have, person. I have people so. in my family who still have not even acknowledged the fact that we made a documentary <laughs> because I think really? they're like, Oh crap. If we acknowledge this, are we going to have to like help? And I mean, it's out there. I started a nonprofit. I write about it. I, we created this documentary and that's on them at this point. That's not on me. I've shared to my heart's content and you can't change people who don't want to be changed and you can't force people mm-hmm. to help you. So it's not your tribe. Yeah. Move along. Yeah. But they're out there. If you yeah. can find them. Yeah. They are. Uh, Tom, do you want to, is there a question? Um, yeah, it's a question that just came in that says, uh, do you think perceptions are also vastly different because having children is a choice versus illness just happening randomly to a typical individual? I've gotten the feeling that people sometimes believe that if we made the choice to have a child, we should have been prepared for something like our son's disability. Um, so yeah, that's one. I've heard that argument. And um, again, it goes back to what we were saying about caregiving. I mean, every single person enters the world needing care and most likely you're going to leave the world needing care and you're lucky if you don't require it in between. So until we sort of wrap our minds around every single form of care within our society and we honor it and we value it and we give it its proper place, I don't think we're going to see those perceptions change because yeah. right now those direct care workers, they are like kind of viewed as can be Joe Schmo off the street. As long as you can sit with my person, that's about all you have to do. And so it's, and I'm not saying that there aren't wonderful direct care workers out there. There are, but the um, qualifications seem to continuously diminish through the years. And I think it's a direct result of us as a society, not honoring that profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and I think people don't always realize the extent. Like I heard someone say recently, they they get the pushback of they're advocating for a program, and they hear that people say, "Well, it's just you know, it's parents. Why there's tons of parents? Why does everyone? Why do you need more support? Because as a parent, um, and which seems preposterous to me, right? As, by now, to not realize the difference between parenting and parent caregiving, um, but I, that's not a universal understanding. So I think part of it is as we get more understanding that there is a difference between being a parent and being a parent caregiver that will hopefully kind of be struck that argument because I think you know maybe that's the distinction that needs to be made moving forward Mm -hmm. you know between yeah there's a parent caregiver Mm -hmm. yeah I think I think so and that we we kind of define that term too that like what are what do we call this group of parents um yeah. when we were making the documentary is like there wasn't really a set term um that we could even use so it's hard to if there hasn't been like this kind of recognition of that role um then you're just having to deal with people having no no clue what's really what's really going on right um, all right we don't have a whole lot of time left um do you want to kind of give us an update um where can people go if they have um, more questions for you or want to see what you're up to? Where can people go? Um, <laughs> and email me at just at the Lucas um, I hang out on social media occasionally. Um, just where am I now? Just plus the mess and just Ronnie um, website is just plus the mess.com and the Lucas um, and we had some questions too about like um, showing the documentary or having you speak with a group. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can either go to um, your website, sms.com, um, and there's information about speaking and forms on there. And for the documentary, um, our website is caregiverdoc.com, um, and there's information on there about um, screening the film for groups as well. So whichever avenue you're interested in, and we talk all the time, so we can connect you either way, <laughs> depending on what you're looking for. Um, all right, Tom, any other questions or anything? Um, I, you know, I would just add this. Uh, a lot of what we talked about is the perception of, of uh, caregiving in general uh, in culture. And I mean, just thinking about this last question that this person asked, I, I mean, I would say, that's our hope in one of our hopes in making the film, right, is to be able to um, make some sort of small change in people's perception of caregiving um, uh, in general. I mean, that's that definitely one of the goals. So, if, you know, if you've got people in your life that don't get it, send them this way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, really, and that's um what we envision to is you know having these discussions that are open and honest and we don't always have the answers but the start of it is just talking about it and figuring out what do we even need to be advocating for that would make a difference for families for sure yeah because i think all of our perceptions and thought processes have even changed in the past couple of years as we continue to have these conversations and explore the the relevant topics and hear all the voices entering into the the space that we've created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think we can wrap up there. Um, Thank you everyone for joining and thank you Jess for giving us this time. So many good topics explored and there's always a million more. So (laughs) yeah, if you want to follow on social media, um, we have more bonus content, more screenings, more webinars, Q and A, that kind of thing. So um, if you start at caregiverdoc.com, we can connect you from there. Perfect. All right. Thank you all. All right. Bye-bye. See ya.